Everything is personal right here Everything is personal right here Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of Everything is Personal. And today, our special guest is Barry C. LaBeouf. Not, That's right, the C. Not Barry LaBeouf, it's the C that matters. Right, C stands for cool. I'm a cool guy, so I'm Barry Cool LaBeouf. Oh, Barry, you're very cool, and we started talking about this prior to uh, you know getting on, but uh, for those of you who can't see, Barry's sitting uh, in what he described as a man cave, and the first thing that I saw was baseballs with a P on them. So uh, maybe you can describe uh, to the audience a little bit and tell us why. Yeah, you you are where you are. Well, my two passions in life, be be other than my wife and my kids, are um, baseball and music. Okay, so Len, you and I have some things in common because uh, how much you love music and I do too. And um, so I'm from Philadelphia. And I am not a fair weather fan. I have been a fan of that team from uh, the time I was eight years old and they were 12. I think they had 12 games to go and were up six and a half and lost. And it broke the hearts of people for decades. But I've been following them. And uh, so P is for Philadelphia Phillies. And I have really decorated my entire basement around it and it's not just a man cave it's a fan p-h-a-n cave see i'm a fan p-h-a-n i love, it. I love yeah. it so i don't think there's such a thing as a fair weather philadelphia sports fan i don't think right. that exists i no. mean if you're a philly like i've been i live in la and you know uh, my audience pretty much knows i'm i'm from philly but you know, being from Philly, you take those teams everywhere. I live in L.A., like, uh, as I said, but when the Eagles play the Rams, we oh, yeah. go to watch the Eagles play the Rams. And, I mean, 60% at least of the stadium are, are Eagles fans that travel right. everywhere. Oh, yeah. I went to see the Super Bowl when the uh, Eagles beat the Patriots. My brother and I went there. It was in uh, Minnesota. And we sat on the side of the uh, stadium that was the Patriots side, because it was cheaper, but it was filled with Philadelphia fans. And they were screaming and yelling and standing the entire time and crying after we won. Uh -huh. And it's great. But my brother is a rabid fan and he's what they call a Negadelphian, which is if they <laughs> lose, they go, oh, they don't have any passion. They don't care. They don't have any will. But when they win, he goes, hey, we did great tonight. We're yeah. great. We're great. There's just a lot of passion. So it's, it's yeah. hard to be a Philadelphia fan. So back in the day, I used to go to the Eagles games at the vet and sit in the yeah. 700 level. Sure. And when I try to describe to people, like my daughter goes to Eagles games with me now, I, I, I'm I'm an all sports, uh, like all four sports, uh, but Eagles are my number one, as as right. Phillies uh, seem to be your, your number one. Uh, yes. So I, I was trying to explain to her the experience of sitting in a 700 level and like watching a Dallas Eagles game. And I, I don't think unless you were there, you can describe. I try to tell them, like, you know, they made a court underneath the stadium and all that stuff. Yes. But it's it was insane. Well, they have a jail, like you said, yeah. inside their stadium. So that's that's the that's the community that you and I hail from. Exactly. They have they have a freaking jail in their stadium. Yeah, it's we, I think we get a bad rep around uh you know throwing snowballs and santa, santa claus all that yeah all that stuff i mean uh but he was a bad man. santa he didn't act very well nobody <laughs> exactly. liked him you know i mean come on he didn't have the passion we wanted we per i don't know we the the eagles were probably losing at halftime and that was part of it too so look i, I this wasn't my plan at all of course, like, of since, course. Uh, since we're, we're talking about this now i just wanted to get your thoughts about the 93 phillies the yeah. joe carter like how that how you felt about that and then the winning of the uh, uh of the world series how you felt yeah, about that yeah they won in uh, 1980 and I could not yeah. watch the games because it was too much of a heart attack. They were uh, always by the way, on Barry, the sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I, 
1980, yeah, I, I, I meant the last, uh, well, but yeah, they won in 1980 right. with uh, Mike Schmidt and uh, and Lefty. Yeah, and, and I know you're talking about 93 where yeah. they had uh, Kruk and they had, um, they I think they still had Pete Rose and Perez and Dalton and all those yeah. guys. And, um, you know, that was a great team. That was a heartbreak to lose to Joe Carter hitting a million home runs and all that. <laughs> but I did follow the 2008 team, yeah. and I'm a big fan. And I've been uh, – my son's a big fan, so he and I go every year to Philly. So, you know, the, everything is personal, right? I mean, that's what it's all about. <laughs> and that's what we personally love. So uh, so tell me about Labove and Beyond. Above and Beyond is uh, two different things. Originally, it was my band. I was in a rock band. We called it Above and Beyond. Mm -hmm. My music sold well under 1 million copies, mm -hmm. I must tell you. Uh, but to this day, I love music. Um, I am currently digitally uh, audio editing my um, audio book for my upcoming book, which is released now, which is called The Power of Differentiation. But after I started the band, I got into producing those irritating little ditties called jingles. Wow. And um, so I was in two different businesses, really. I was in the band business trying to, you know, get get the, these really great songs and great guys successful. We backed up John Mellencamp. So we opened for him, uh, which was a great experience. But at a, at a certain point, and it was a very, very critical point in my life, um, I made a decision to move on from music and to pursue a business career. And it was when my father passed away from cancer at 62 years old. So it was a pretty uh, difficult thing for me to go deal with. Uh, and it really occurred to me that, you know, you don't know how long you're going to live. So I'm past 60 three years old now, but I tell everybody I'm on my farewell tour. So, you know, you don't know how long you're going to have, but that's what happened. So my company morphed into being a marketing, advertising and training company. And that's what we do. We, we do a marketing for great companies, training for great companies. Okay. So what are great companies? Well, some are very small and some are family oriented and we love them. And then some are very well known that you, you all will know about, which is Harley Davidson, Mercedes Benz, Hyundai, Kia, carrier heating and air conditioning. You know, like I said, when you're working with Harley Davidson or you're working with Sea-Doo, Ski-Doo, Can-Am, McAllen Scotch, Stoli Vodka, you know, those are great names. And um, so we've been very fortunate, but we've, you know, we've earned our keep. We're, we're out there and we're working hard every day. Uh, I definitely want to talk about the the marketing and branding side, but a couple more questions about music. I was just curious because I, I dove into the catalog a little bit on YouTube and I was listening to some of the songs. How, how would you describe the music that you were creating and what was your goal with that i wanted to be a very successful songwriter and producer i'm not the lead singer i'm an okay singer uh, i had a band with a great lead singer and uh, those were the more popular songs we were doing kind of a rock style of music uh, at our most popular probably like journey you know companies like or bands like journey or uh, could be sticks, somebody like that. But early on, I was doing progressive music like Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And I wrote a rock opera and I, I'm pretty prolific. I'm not bragging that I'm a good songwriter. I'm just, I'm, I can write a lot of them and that's what I do best. Well, I, I think, uh, uh, Pete Townsend's looking for a new rock opera. Uh, so oh, yeah. maybe you can, you can send him something, uh, that he can uh, try to create. <laughs> well, that's what inspired me when he did Tommy. Uh -huh. I thought, God, that's interesting. And I didn't like the album. I loved certain songs, but I thought there was so much filler to it. I went, oh, but I, I thought, you know, God, I could do that. And one of the positives about trying to write a rock opera, and this has to do with business or anything, it's such a challenge. And what it does is it gives you a framework because to be creative, a lot of people don't see this, but this, I live this life. All I do is create 
you want guardrails, you want constraints around you so that within there you can go crazy. So when you write a rock opera, you think, oh my gosh, that's wild and out of control. No, you've got a story and these songs have to move chronologically or at least logically one after another. And what it does is it forces you into this box and within that box, you start to find really cool corners and edges and things you can play with. Yeah, I, I think uh, that analogy is great because, uh, you know, I have I have ADD. And mm -hmm. if I don't have, um, if I don't have parameters set up in mm -hmm. systems, it'll be yep. all over the place, squirrel moments all the time. So having that allows me to create and use my superpower but with, uh, you know, with some sort of, uh, you know, restraint around, you know, yeah. where I can go and not paint outside those uh, lines. Right. Uh, so how do you get into the E&Y Entrepreneur Hall of Fame? Like, uh, is there is there a ceremony? Like, what, what happens <laughs> with that? I'm just curious. I don't know if there's a ceremony. I know I'm in there. Um, I, what happened was I am a reluctant entrepreneur, Len, I did not want to run a business. So it was not my vision. So never once was I growing up going, I love business. Actually, I did not like business. I did not want to sell. And what happened was after I decided I was going to run my business instead of my band, North American Van Lines came to me and I think we all know them and they were in my hometown. I was doing some audio work, some recordings for them, nothing serious. And one day the leader of the company called me and said, Barry, I want to outsource all of our marketing to your company and give you a three-year agreement and you can do all of our marketing. So being the great entrepreneur I was, Len, I said, uh, I don't think so. You know, I kind of like doing audio and, uh, you know, I'd love to just say I had this vision. I didn't, I didn't. And I gave them names of other people, other companies. This went on and on every two, three months, Barry, I want you to, and I go, no, here's another couple companies. So one day, and I'll remember this the rest of my life, I get a phone call and they go, Hey, uh, North American van lines is on the phone. And I went, Oh gosh, here we go again. So I go, yeah, Mike. And he goes, Barry, I want to outsource our marketing to you. And I said, Mike, I've given you all these other companies. I've suggested all of this. Why do you keep coming back to me? And he said, because we trust you. And Len, I mean, that just hit me like a pile of bricks. And I, in the moment said, okay, let's do it. Now you can say, okay, what's that have to do with Ernst & Young? I took over that department. When I say took it over, I basically bought that department. It became my company's marketing. I worked with them. And within about a year, there was the Entrepreneur of the Year competition. And I was nominated because of all the work we had done for North American Van Lines. We were chosen and I was brought out to San Diego to be at the ceremony and everything else. And I actually won it a couple of years after that for another category. It was a great honor. Now here's what was really the best part of it. The sponsor of that year's Entrepreneur of the Year program was Audi. So the car maker, Audi. And I thought, oh, that's nice. So I get home and I get a nice little gift from Audi. Here's a bunch of CDs, music CDs. I thought, okay, that's great. And I thought, you know, I'll call the guy up who sent them. So I call the guy up and he goes, hey, the uh, Detroit Auto Show is next week. You want to come up? We can meet. And I went, um, yeah, sure. I go up. We have a great time. He says, hey, by the way, I'm quitting Audi. I'm leaving next week. So I thought, I'm all the way up here. I thought, okay. He then says, here are two people you can talk to. They're going to be taking my place. I ended up... a uh, a 25 year relationship with Audi with one of those two people. So that's what happened. It's, it's circuitous. It's something where, you know, I think I dive in very deeply and people can sense that I care. And I have this relationship with my people where they care. So that's what's happened. That's how I've over time with my people grew all of this. 
So l- l- let's rewind all the way back. Like you, you grew up in Philly. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was your family? Were your parents together at the time? Uh, do you have siblings? What was your childhood like? A uh, childhood was uh, interesting. My father and mother w- remained married their entire lives, both passed away at 62 years old. So, uh, you know, a couple of years apart, uh, they kind of were the Bickersons. So they were never really happy. And I begged them to get divorced and they wouldn't do it. Uh, I have a brother, younger brother, and he and I were in rock bands together, two man rock bands. When I was 14, he was 12. I hope the listeners don't imagine this because it was not pretty, but I played drums sang and my right hand played the keyboards on some songs so i was like the one man band thing and my brother played guitar and sang there was no bass guitar there were no other musicians it was two guys making a lot of racket so we did that and that was how i was brought up now the backstory to my music is that i was brought up by my dad with the vision that he wanted me to be viewed as a genius. He taught me algebra when I was three years old. So I was growing up as this little kid and he would go, okay, Barry, what's X plus three equals six, you know, whatever. I mean, I literally was brought up doing algebra at three to the point, Len, that in second grade, the teacher goes, okay, what's two plus two? And she goes, Barry, what's two plus two? So I said, well, it depends what X is. And she said, who's been teaching you algebra? And I said, my dad. And she said, that's it. You're kicked out of school. I'm going to call your parents and send you home. And she sent home a nasty note to my dad saying, you're destroying this boy's mind. He'll be a lopsided individual. Stop this. And you know what? I think it was good for me because I never had an issue with math for the rest of my life. I love it. And math is very related to music. Music is all intervals. You know, you can't find a great musician who's horrible at math. You can't. They all understand math. It's all patterns. It's all, uh, it's all you know, mathematical equations going on in your mind. So if your if your dad was trying to raise you as a as a genius, what was your parents? Uh, what were their feelings and thoughts about you going into music? Uh, they they liked it. Uh, my mom wanted me to go into music, or um, I'm sorry, my mom wanted me to go into business, mm-hmm. and I said no, I hate it. She said, oh, your grandfather was a great entrepreneur, and I said I don't want to hear about it. I hate it. <laughs> my dad's family was a bunch of drummers. Okay. Yeah, I'm a, but I took after my mom's side. So I'm a tall guy, six, two, six, three. My mom's side of the family was tall. They're, they're business people. My dad's side are a bunch of five foot eight guys with full heads of hair, unlike me. And they all are built like Fred Flintstone. And, you know, they they all look and sound and they look just like Fred Flintstone. They're these hairy guys that are, you know, okay. And uh, so I knew I was a little different. I knew I wasn't quite the normal model for a LaBeouf. I looked around and go, you know, and then as I started to lose my hair, I'm going, dad, I, I, am I losing my hair? Yeah. No, I can't lose your hair. You're LaBeouf. Yeah. We don't (laughs) lose our hair. Yeah. So, but um, my dad was an engineer and he was a very introverted guy. And my mom was super extroverted. And uh, I mean, I, I never have talked about this, but my mom, I remember when she was in her late 40s, early 50s, young guys, when I say young guys, 30 year old guys would be coming after her. They were all over my I mean, will you leave my mom alone? My mom was 50 years old. I mean, shit, that's old. I mean, come <laughs> on. Right. And uh, but she was she was the outgoing personality kid and my dad was the very, very reclusive engineering genius guy. Yeah, it's, it's funny. My 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 dad was also an engineer, so a lot of a lot of parallels. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're writing your book, uh, the power of uh, differentiation. Uh, yes, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, to say it, yes, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, this is more for me. I, I'm just trying to figure out how, how does a company differentiate their brand. Well, I appreciate that, and I also appreciate you said differentiation because sometimes I'm on 
podcast and they they can't even pronounce it i go i know it's six <laughs> syllables 15 <laughs> letters it's like yeah dude, what a great name for something right <laughs> The thing that, so here's what I have so much passion for. Differentiation is not about superiority. So uh, for those of us who are watching Len, you see a bunch of different music uh, memorabilia. So there's Amy Winehouse and it looks like there's Kiss. And uh, I don't know who that, I don't know if it's Ozzy or is it Ozzy Osbourne? Am I right? Behind uh -huh. you? Yeah, there's tell. there's Ozzy, there's uh, Beastie Boys, there's uh, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, but okay. Led so Zeppelin. here's here's the deal, and Led Zeppelin, of course. Stevie okay, Wonder. so and then you got the Beatles way up in the corner. You got Stevie Wonder. Okay, that's a beautiful um, example of differentiation. They're different. They're unique. You could say Stevie is superior to the Beatles. And that Kiss is superior to Led Zeppelin, although I don't think anybody would say that, but let's say you did say that. But you know what they really are? They're different. They're distinct. They have their own style. And what's so important in business, and those of us who are solo entrepreneurs, I'm not, but those of us who are, could look at it the same way about themselves. You have to identify and discover, not create your brand. The biggest problem a company will have is they go, hey, our competitors are doing this and this and that, and they're doing this and this, and that we can do that. Let's do that. Okay. The problem is a lot of times you're not that good at it and you can't sustain it. So differentiation and what my company does is we go in to companies and we will literally go into their facilities. We'll talk with their people, their customers. We'll look at if, if they're a manufacturer, we will look at how they build their product. If they're a service company, what kind of technology we find what they do. That's just a little different. And here's where it gets great line. This is where it gets great. So I think that's great. That's awesome. Here's where it really gets better. What we require our clients to do is before they then tell the world, promote it, launch it. They celebrate it with the most important people first, their employees, the people who are behind the product, the people who build service and represent that brand. That gives people significance. It gives them meaning. Otherwise, you're working for a bunch of suits who don't care and they're going to squeeze every ounce of money out of you. You said something really, really interesting, uh, a bunch of things, but something kind of stood out uh, where you sort of discover your brand. I was wondering, as an entrepreneur, like how much of you, your own personality, you, your own essence uh, is in that brand? Like, you know, obviously we know Steve Jobs, right? Apple, it's right. synonymous, but yes. there's other brands who they have a CEO and their CEO, the personality doesn't come through. Right. Is there like when you go through this, do you interview the entrepreneur, the, the C level, C suite, and see is there like a dominance where they take on the you know the brand characteristics and the vice versa? What a great question. Um, I've never had that. I've done 75 podcasts in the last five months, and not one time was that asked. That is a brilliant question. You know, the answer to this is if the CEO leader, whatever you want to call this man or woman, if they are the person who founded the company, they are 100% what the brand is about. So if Len founded the company and he is this uh, real nerdy engineering nutcase who's all over the place trying to get everything just to be absolutely perfect, guess what? That's what his brand is about. His brand is fastidious. His brand is just exactly perfect in this way, even to the point of not making money because Len doesn't care about that. He cares about making it just perfect. However, if that company is no longer run by that person and they bring in an accountant type person or they bring in a marketing person, they do not necessarily follow that brand and they do not become that brand. And there is sometimes a great divide between what that person thinks they need to do to make it successful and what that brand really has been and still probably is all about. Yeah, Barry, I, I mean, this is my personal consultation with uh, people. Uh, I, I'm just because 
you know, there's a certain brand that I, I I'm I'm a founder of a company. Yes. And my company is a genetics company. We do genetic uh, sequencing yeah. analysis and all that stuff. I'm not a geneticist. I don't look like a geneticist, like what a typical genetic, what you would think yes. that. There's a certain, you know, I have a certain brand that's my personal brand where I go out, you know, I wear band tees all the time. Like this right. is what I'm comfortable in. I don't, I'm not, I used to be a, a, a Price Waterhouse guy, suit and tie kind of mm -hmm. thing. I don't, I don't do that anymore. But I don't feel like my brand has my essence, even though I hear people talking about it. Oh, that's lens company. Somebody's talking about DNA yeah. and presenting it. Oh, that's lens company. So they associate that with me, but the company is not me. And I'm not sure that I ever had the opportunity to put my own essence into my brand only when I'm presenting it somewhere else. Long-winded kind of question, but you said something really interesting to me because like, Bill Gates, right? So yeah. it's Microsoft, it's Bill Gates. Yeah. Then he says, Steve Ballmer, there's there's two mm -hmm. completely different and opposite people. So mm -hmm. there is a brand that was a nerdy brand of uh, Microsoft, but then you have yeah. Steve Ballmer jumping up and down and yelling mm -hmm. at people, a completely different type of thing. Did, he, was, did Bill Gates put his own brand into Microsoft, and then Steve said, "Now nah, I'm going to change it up, but still keep it, and you know, Im implement my own personality in that." Uh, how do you go through that exercise? Um, I definitely believe because I've read a lot about what Gates has done. Gates' whole approach to Microsoft, which was very different than his competitor, Jobs and Apple, was all about the Gates approach. Now you can bring a different person in who might be more of a cheerleader and might be more of a salesperson, if that person erases what your brand is all about, uh, they're probably in big trouble. They can have different personalities. You know, I, I'm not intimately familiar with your brand, but let's say you run a brand and you're not some guy that's a scientist, but let's say it's a, um, and I'm just gonna make this up, but let's say it's a very unique, almost outlaw approach to doing such and such compared to the competition. Well, that might be your approach. You might be saying, hey, I don't want to go down the normal path everyone else does. I believe you got to look at things in a more unique and original way. And I don't care what anyone says. Now, my point is you don't maybe know anything about genetics, but that may be what your brand is about. That may be one of your core values. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at my company, one of my core values at my company is related to music and it's jamming, J-A-M, jamming, and we jam. And you know, some people say, oh yeah, that's kind of cute. And we go, no, no, we're serious. We literally do hundreds of jams every year. I had a client I, I I just started to work with. And he said, now, because we're going to run a jam session for him. And he said, now, uh, do you ever do these? Is it something you do much of? I said, I, well, I said in the last year, we've done about 130 of them. But, you know, and he went, oh, okay. We jam. We are constantly collaborating. And that's part of our essence. Now, I don't go sell jam sessions, although we do them and we charge for them. But my point is we're not the jam session retail outlet we're doing things using jam sessions to help produce something that we think is great for our clients so i think same thing with you just just suggesting yeah no i think it makes total sense what you're saying it's uh mm -hmm. you know you there it, it's it's funny because i was uh presenting at an event uh, and there was a bunch of athletes like uh, professional athletes uh, there was uh, also Lee Steinberg was on this panel, like the, you know, show sure. me your money uh, agent and all these people. So yeah. the guy that's introducing everybody is like so-and-so, you know, NHL uh, player, so-and-so NFL, blah, blah, mm -hmm. uh, UFC gets to me and he's stumped and he called, yeah. he goes, a oh, uh, sciency guy. He actually called me a sciency guy. Right. Somebody in the audience. <laughs> Probably cracked up. Not only cracked up, they sent me a box of T-shirts with a hashtag sciency guy. So right. that's the, the moniker. I pick. Not a scientist, sciency guy, but they couldn't describe sort of, you know, my my brand and my essence. 
Okay, well, Len, you, you you brought up Microsoft and Jobs. Okay, Jobs was not a good programmer. He was not known as a good programmer. And in fact, people like Gates looked down on Jobs because he was not advanced. So if you just step back for a minute, you go, well, how can he run a computer company? He's not a great programmer. Come on. That wasn't what his talent was. You know, he was an out-of-the-box thinker to to a fault. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, I look at, you know, your your brand isn't the end product you're producing, but what you do produce, that product, that brand, that end result, your brand is inside every bit of the things you create. So for you, it might be an irreverence, a unique approach to something. And they go, wow, that's what the sciencey guy comes up with. Yeah. Makes sense. How do you decide to write your first book? Well, my first book I wrote years ago, uh, decades ago. This book, if you're talking about this book, what I wanted to do, and, and no, I was journey... talking about. I, I'm sorry, Barry. I, yeah. I mean, to interrupt. No, I was yeah. talking about. And uh, it, so I, I looked at a bunch of books you have. You have these animations in your earlier books. Yeah, I'm just yeah. curious. That's really. I should have asked a question in, in that oh. part. Like you, okay. you have these books and you have these animations. I'm, I'm just curious how you came up with that. Okay, I'll tell you exactly how I came up with it. Okay, it's a, a group of stories called the Umbrella Series. It's all about somebody who makes umbrellas, needs to work with a dealer who sells umbrellas. And it actually uh, actually was a vision of the future. This is uh, 20 years ago because it, it basically painted what happens when the internet gets involved. We called the, instead of calling it internet, we called it the loudspeaker. But what happened was, here's exactly how that series created. And it was one dozen books. They were illustrated. They were what are known as business parables, meaning they're, you know, 30 page books and they're stories of characters and all that. Here's what happened. One of my employees sat in my office one day and she says, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, Hey, I said, let's have a competition, fun competition. Let's, let's write a book, a parable book about business, anything you want to write. Why don't you go do it? I'll do it. And I'll tell you what, let's give each other a total of two hours. Let's write a book. And he, and she goes, well, what are we going to write about? And I go, well, you go write your book. I'll go write mine. She goes, well, what's the title? I said, I don't know. So she left and I sat there for a minute and I think there was an umbrella in the corner of my office because it had been raining. And I thought, you know, I've never thought about umbrellas. That's, that's kind of a cool thing. I don't know. What if somebody builds umbrellas just and, and falls in love with them, just like people who build cars and get all caught up in all the different things and they're all crazy. And then they have dealers and all this. And I created in two hours, the first book, which was called The Umbrella Story. That's how it was created. Now, it was refined, as Mark Twain said, I didn't have time to write a shorter message because I, I didn't have time to write a shorter message. So, but it was, uh, it, was a, it was a game. It was fun. So I just was curious, do you ever work with companies that are raising money? And uh, they're looking to, you know, raise a series, either they're, either they're a startup uh, or, you know, they need to raise their next round. Uh, do they engage with you? And do you have a different, if so, do you have a different approach to working with companies that are, you know, their goal is to get funding rather than, you know, some of the branding work that you're doing in marketing? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I work with at times, not often, a startup, and they're they're pretty tough to work with because a lot of times they don't have a lot of money, yeah. and they're on a shoestring, and it's a tough one. It's tough. I work every day with private equity firms that are raising their next big fund of you know so many billion dollars, and when they purchase a, a company to put in their portfolio, they call us up and say, okay, we just bought X business. We want you to go in and look at what they're doing because we believe that, let's say they paid 250 million for the company. We wanna see that company be worth a billion. And I want you to go find some things that could really stand out that they could promote. And often we will, 
the thing we also try to do to help the, the those PE firms, because we work with some incredibly great PE firms, is that we really try to influence them not to dilute the uniqueness of that product or brand that they purchase. Because it's very easy to say, you know, let's get rid of that one little thing. Oh, let's get rid of that. Yeah, you don't need to have that. No. Like, and, and we say, look, we know that you're a genius and we know that you guys can get things done operationally so much better. But you know what? That weird quirky thing is why a lot of people love and can recognize your product. Why change that thing? So we come in, we help them. And I, I have to tell you, I love working with PE firms. They are a blast. Well, we're, we're going to have to talk offline because uh, my company is raising their Series B. I was not that I was, uh, you know, looking to talk about this uh, personally on the, on the show, but you know, I, I used to way back in the day. I used to work with a company called Safeguard Scientific uh, in uh, Wayne, Pennsylvania, pri private mm -hmm. equity uh, sure. firm, and. That's the kind of work that we did. I, I looked at more on the marketing side, on the system side. How do we integrate their systems into our system? But you hit the nail on the head. It's it's they they're always trying to see how you can do a full integration. And sometimes right. we'll let this brand stand alone and not change it because you you change that that what makes them so unique right. as a brand. Right. So I, I really appreciate you going into that. A, a very brief version of a longer story. I work with some great ambulance brands and one of these tremendous leaders that we get to work with brought us in and said, look, we have six brands that we've acquired over the years. And he said, look, I'm new here. He said, but to me, I think we've homogenized these brands. I can't tell one from another. So we went in and looked at it. And what had happened was over the time that that company had owned them, owned all six, what happened was the high end brand and the low end brand literally were built on the same line in the same plant by the same people, had the same products, had the same features. And to make it even worse for me, their websites were exactly the same. You know, they they looked the same. And and the the thing that got really bad was the dealers, the people who sell and represent them, said, "Look, there's no difference between any of these products. One used to be the aspirational brand, the best of the best, and the other was a good, darn good, entry level value brand. And now." They're, they're indistinguishable. So the thing you got to do is you got to say, wait a minute, there are people that want to pay a little more money because we put sound deadening foam throughout the interior of that ambulance to keep it quieter so that the paramedics can work on their patients better. Other ambulances don't do that. That's why ours is a little more expensive. And the point is, why eliminate that? That's why some people bought that ambulance. And they wisely did do that. They gave each of their brands what is known as a lane to swim in. And that's what you need to do. You got to have your lane. Is there a standard process that you follow when you're engaged with a company? Or is it, or are, are you playing jazz? So to use a musical analogy. Okay. All right, here's what we're doing. We're playing jazz, but we have the song structure. Mm -hmm. and But we realize that at some point, if it gets really interesting digging into this one riff, we're going to dig longer. Yeah, okay? You're jamming. So you're jamming. We're jamming. So you never know. Right. But we have a five-step process. We have one step nobody in the world does. That's one of our differentiators. We have another step that very few do. So very quickly, what happens is we're brought in our first step is relatively common. It's a brand assessment. We talk to humans, whether it's employees or dealers or distributors or leaders or customers or suppliers, and we learn and we listen for things. We listen between the lines. If somebody says, oh, yes, they are good quality company and they have good service selection and value, I go, okay, I don't want to hear that. Let's talk about something that's unique or interesting. All right, so we learn from that. We then do the next step, which nobody does. 
which is called a technical immersion. And that is we go into the facility and it could be a service or technology company, Len. It does not have to be a manufacturing plant. We go in and we're looking at the technology, the techniques, the processes, the features, anything that they're doing that could be unique. And we spend all day there. We're digging and digging and we're working with their engineers, their designers. We're getting in there. We're finding things. Okay. Now keep in mind, we're not trying to discover, I'm sorry, we're not trying to create, we are trying to discover. So we're not in there saying, hey, let's go build a new factory. Let's come up with brand new products. We're going, no, no, no. What are you doing that's unique? We then, third step, we put together our results, recommendations. Fourth step is that's when we go to what's known as execution. So that could be putting a new website together. And that's where most agencies start. You know, somebody says, hey, can you help me? Okay, great. Let's do a website and a logo. But we do all that work before even considering that. And then our fifth step is unique, not as unique as the technical immersion, but the fifth step is launching the product, but launching internally first, celebrating it. That's our five steps. So that's our structure and, you know, like you said, it depends. We'll dive into certain portions a little deeper. But by the time we're through that process, we know that company inside and out. And we've saved them a lot of money. And here's one final thing. We've identified what they do well. And we have said, do not change that. And that's a lot easier than throwing everything away and trying to become something new. Yeah, it makes total sense. I went through these types of uh you know, especially working in as a consultant years ago, that's what we did, like brand assessments work and you, you do your mission, vision, values, all that other stuff. Yeah. I think I think what I uh, what I took out of this, which was really interesting, is when you interview uh, employees or you talk to the executives and you talk to the customers, et cetera, you're trying to see, I think that's what you said, what I heard. You're trying to see there's a pattern but that pattern is to what the unique aspect of that company is. If everybody's saying this, 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 a bunch of other things, but you're like, this word or this keeps coming up, this yes. might be the brand essence that they may be missing and they didn't because they're too deep into it. Is that? That's a hundred percent right. Yeah. The, we listen between the lines. We, uh, we work with a really great law firm and they're, they were upset because they said, you know, th they have the reputation of being old, stodgy, expensive. They don't know what to do about it. And we talked with their employees and their customers, and there was a word that kept coming up. And this word allowed them to charge more, uh, at times be a little conservative, let's say, but it, it really underscored their value. And the word was bandwidth. And that's what they give their clients. You go to them and they can go across all these specialties. And yeah, you're paying a little more. Okay. And then, you know, they don't have the newest building in the block. Mm -hmm. their, their building's nice enough, but they're not the cool kids. But, you know, they have the bandwidth to be the one, I would have to say the one trusted expert that you can turn to. And that's what made the difference. One word. What is that one or two words that you want people to say about you if if I give them a call and I ask them about Barry? Well, what I do, some people will say it's a what's a superpower, but what what really is is my company can find the magic. And we will find the magic in the process, the products, the processes, the people, the culture, the experience, the customer experience. We find the magic and we help our clients honor it and celebrate it. I'm going to tell you what I think. I I've I did a little bit of uh, digging around and I and I started seeing without even having this conversation. I want to see what are the review what people are saying about you and i'll tell you two words that kept coming up you may or may not know this honesty and integrity i saw that come up time after time after time so that's how people see you and maybe that's the main reason why people want to continue doing business with you 
Uh, were you aware of that? And how do you feel about that? I feel great hearing that. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. I believe that without that, then you can be really smart. Nobody wants to work with you, right? Yeah. You can be this dirt bag, but you go, well, he's really smart, but I don't trust the guy. And you have to be honest and have the integrity. You have to be able to say no. And I, I do think that I'm, a, I'm really opposed to being an order taker. I, I hate order taking because there's no value in doing that. And I think one thing when a client talks to us, the easiest thing is they say, I want to do blah, 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 blah. And you go, okay, well, what if the answer really isn't okay? What if the answer is, you know, I, I hear you. We could make some money on that, but I don't think that's what's best for you. And then you have an interesting discussion. And I think that's where our value comes in. Uh, if you can tell me a little bit about what you got out of your work at UPS, I find that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Len, you pulled another one out. Nobody's asked me about my time at UPS. Um, my, I'm shocked you would ask about that. I worked at, uh, UPS for five and a half years and it was while I was going to college I got fired one day. I was in the union. I was fired one day because I was collecting money for one of our coworkers who um, who just had his first kid. So we were collecting money to give um, give to um, his wife. Well, not really money to give to her, but to buy flowers. And I was fired for insubordination for leaving my work area, even though I was all caught up. And I had learned at UPS how to curse very well. I had never cursed as a kid. <laughs> I became a master's degree cursor because uh, that's how it was there. I mean, it was just that kind of environment. And so we had a curse-a-thon back and forth and uh, <laughs> they decided to fire me. So what happened was I went home and I thought, my gosh, I'm fired. I turned to a union steward as I walked out of the parking lot. And I said, what do I do? And he goes, well, you know, you can write a grievance up. And I said, well, I'm going to write a grievance. He goes, yeah. He said, you know, you don't know if you'll win or not. So I wrote this grievance handwritten on yellow sheets of paper, came in because they were dead wrong with what they were doing. And I, I won't go into specifics, but let's just say the supervisor who fired me was on some serious illegal drugs at the time and was getting into a lot of other trouble. And so they, they basically said, LaBeouf, we're, we're going to let you come back, but you're going to have this on your record and you're in big trouble. And I said, no, no, um, I want full back pay. I want an apology and I want to start tomorrow. And they said, no, you're crazy. And I said, look, I already wrote the grievance out. That's it. So I walked out, the, the union steward said, he said, he said, kid, you are out of your mind. They pulled me back in the room, said, okay, you got your job back. We're sorry. I said, that's great. That's great. Union steward turns to me and says, you know, UPS has never had a part-time union steward because I was a part-timer. He said, I'm going to recommend you are. So best to my knowledge, Len, I became the first part-time union steward in UPS history. That's great. And my company's worked with UPS on and off over the years. And, yeah. uh, and also that's, I learned how to, you know what I did learn? I learned that the union did not really help. And I learned that I had to deal with the people at the company and negotiate. That's what I learned. Well, it's great lessons to be able to be, you know, on your own and know that you, you have to have your own back. Uh, yeah. Uh, now I, I got up every morning at three 30 to go do that thing for five hours, listen to heavy metal rock and roll music. As I was driving down the road to get to the, what we called the sort, which was the plant where we were, you know, where all the conveyor belts were at. And uh, that's what I did for five and a half years. How do you, uh, how do you get your clients today? Is it, do you, is it more word of mouth that you've already established yourself to a certain point where people reach out to you or do you proactively go out and uh, look for clients as well? We're very proactive. So we meet as an entire company two times a week for 30 minutes and discuss every idea that we are, we are bringing proactively to clients or prospects. 
So we are extremely active. Most of our business does come from existing clients and it comes from either uh, growing that relationship or a lot of times our clients move on. They get fired or they quit and they go to a new company and then they call us up and say, hey, you want to work with me? And I go, heck yeah, I do. And that's how we've done that too. So we do that. We, you know, part of the marketing of the company is my book because I want to move the hearts and minds of 1 million people through the book, not necessarily sell a million copies. I'm not even expecting that in the least, but I want to move the hearts and minds of people. And I believe that every once in a while, somebody's going to go, Hey, I kind of want to talk to this person. And that's how it works. So we have, we are extremely active in our marketing. Tell me a little bit about your charitable endeavors, what you, uh, what you're doing with that. As we have, you know, there, there are churches we, we support. There's the ballet in our area that we support. We have, my wife and I have our own foundation and our children who are grown up, you know, 25, 30 years old, uh, participate with us. And we, every year and then invest, so to speak, we give money to charities of all kinds. And, but it's pretty eclectic. It depends on, uh, you know, what we're looking at. We spent many, many years helping a, uh, human trafficking, uh, group, anti-human trafficking group, of course, uh, work on how to, you know, better make things safer for young women and young men. So it's a pretty wide swath. Uh, a very large part of my estate goes to charitable giving. One fourth of it goes to charitable giving. So it's a big deal. Um, I don't brag about it, but I also, when when we're working with uh, nonprofits, when I say working, we don't make profit on nonprofits. We will uh, generally do our work for free. We will share that not to brag, but to inspire other companies to step up as well. Sure. Uh, are there any, in, in your experience of working with all these different companies, are there any intangibles that you see that keep coming up over and over that, we, I don't want to say ensure success, but, uh, you know, replicate success due to these in, intangibles that people may not be aware of? When we see a leader that is very receptive and vulnerable, we usually will see success. You have to be vulnerable. So uh, if the leader is what we call a seagull, which is someone who comes in, I want to do this and this and that, and he or she leaves and their underlings work with us for a few months. And then that person swoops back in and blows things up and their people are crying and upset with them and leave. We find that that's a, a recipe for disaster because that person's really not open. The person's not really listening. And he or she swoops in and they're, they're people, the poor people. I, how are they going to go fight that boss? You know, they're just going to go, yeah, yeah, boss. Yeah, yeah. And then honestly, my people get the wrath of that. And that's why we have quit those companies. We, we resigned them. So I see the opposite, Len. The great, great clients that I've had are the ones that go, look, I need help here. I don't know where we're going wrong. Can you take a look? And that vulnerability is, to me, critical for success. Yeah, I, I, just to kind of frame that a little bit from my perspective, it, it, there's a, a, a growth mindset. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I see this in companies all the time. And I, I, I try to be extremely cognizant of that in, in my company. But I see that all the time is this and it's a it's a it's a human thing if you're locked in and a rigid and you don't have this kind of growth mindset then you're you're not feeding that tree and eventually it's going to die mm -hmm. you, you yourself have to be open to personal development grow constantly and if you're able to do that and humble yourself say i don't really know I believe that can flow back into the entire company and lift everybody. And way too many companies and too many uh, C-level executives, founders, or or even C-suite, anybody, the, the rigidity is the thing that I think is is detrimental to growth in companies. It may they may be successful for a certain amount of time based on momentum, but eventually, you know, you're that that watering uh, you know goes away and it, and it dries out. 
Mm -hmm. You're right. I think that the the very best leaders I've been around are pretty humble, even if they're intimidating to their people. Ultimately, they're humble. They don't think that they're geniuses. They don't think they have it all figured out. And they're very, very focused on learning. They're curious. They're receptive. They want to know at least what others think so they can make a good decision. And the other thing I just said there, I think it's really important, and that is they're decisive. So they're not sitting back going, well, I don't know. I Well, th that leader is just not going to pull it off. I have some questions I usually ask all my guests. Uh, there's some music-related questions for, I ask you in a second. But since you're a Philly guy and a sports fan, I'm just curious if you can name your favorite player in I don't know if you're all for sports, but let's start with the you know baseball and and uh, and football. Who would they be? Yeah, baseball and football. I I have so many favorite players. Uh, I I grew up. There was a guy named Johnny Callison way back in in, in the day, and he was a left-handed outfielder for the Phillies, and he was great. And he was clutch. He was always coming through. You know the teams behind. He's coming through. So I always loved him. In football, I loved Randall Cunningham. I thought as a as a quarterback, I still think it's amazing. He, as a quarterback, he was great. As a runner, he was great. And he has, I believe, still the record for the longest punt in the history of the NFL. I believe it was 99 yards. Uh, that is talent. Yeah. And he was a really good person. You know, he wasn't this jerk of a guy. He was a good guy. So those are my two favorites. Um you know, in basketball, I followed the Sixers for so many years, and I loved uh, Dr. J, Julius Irving, and Moses Malone. Uh, just incredible. I was not a giant Iverson fan because I thought it was funny, yeah. but um, I loved Moses Malone. And when he came on and they won, and I grew up, now my favorite basketball player, period, was Wilt Chamberlain. Yeah. And I just, there's there was nobody like him and never has been, and never will be. Uh, not not really a Flyers fan, or not not a, uh, not a big one. But yeah. I mean, I followed them. I mean, you know, the Broad Broad Street Bullies. But um, I loved them. I loved them. But I didn't have like one one favorite. You know, yeah. I, I I followed them. Yeah. yeah, I used to when I was growing up. I I got a Bobby Clark hockey stick, and that was my, yeah. I love Bobby Clark. Yeah. It. Yeah. Okay, so uh, some music stuff. Uh, do you remember the very first concert that you attended? And if so, what was it? I believe the first, I've I've wondered about this. I think it was the Bee Gees. They came to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and it was the Bee Gees. And I actually had a date with a girl with them. And, and they were good. Yeah. Well, what was the last concert that you attended? Oh, my gosh. Uh I, I attend so many of them. Well, I I attended a concert, and I'm going tomorrow night to this. Um, there's a, a small three-man group called Time for Three, and we invest in them. They're they're involved with a nonprofit, but they are they travel and play all over the world. They're three classically trained musicians. They do a bunch of mashups. Time for Three. So that's my last concert, and tomorrow night I'm seeing them again. Super cool. Okay, uh, in one year, you can only listen to five albums. Now, you don't have to name the actual name of the album. It could be like, you know, the Bee Gees or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be those five albums? Uh, Black Country Communion, if you're familiar with them. My own band, which was called Mark Urgent. I, I love that music. I think it's great stuff. So I'd listen to them. Led Zeppelin and the Beatles. And I would say my top guy beyond those would be Tom Petty. I love Tom Petty. I saw him, one of his very last concerts uh, with my daughter. I mean, he passed away within a couple months and great. Loved him. Yeah. No, I, 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 went, I saw him at the Hollywood Bowl. Right to this last show. Right oh my gosh! Away. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, 
final bonus question before I let you talk about your book and everything else. Uh, please describe what your room looked like growing up. <laughs> My room growing up had pennants, so baseball pennants uh, all over it. And also one that said Cherry Hill, because we would go to New Jersey and there was Cherry Hill. I don't know why, but it was there. <laughs> but it was uh, baseball cards taped up to the wall. That's what it was, is all baseball and, uh, you know, baseball cards, things like that, because that's what I loved. I wanted to be a baseball player. All right, cool. Uh, Barry, I really want to thank you. Where can people reach out to you uh, for business? Where can they find uh, the power of differentiation? Um, anything else that you want to tell people? Sure. Uh, Amazon has the book, The Power of Differentiation. The name is Labov, L-A-B-O-V. It's there today. You can reach me two different spots, uh, labov.com. That's my company's website and barrylabov.com. That's my personal website. There also is a little bit of music on there. There's some free stuff you can download without, you know, sharing your email. And you can also connect with me there. There's a lot of opportunity to just say, Hey, what are you doing, man? What do you think of this? And it's a great way to connect. So that's how it is. And uh, I'll tell you, Len, I really appreciate this. You've asked me several questions I have never been asked. And I, 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 I get, I got to give you kudos for that. Uh, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It's, it was fun. I, uh, you know, Philly guy, Philly guy, but also, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm always curious about people's journeys. And I find it fascinating how serendipity just creates yes. these opportunities if you're open to them. And a lot of people are just going through the motions of this is what I, I'm going to do. And they're missing these things that are coming at them. And I, I think that you're a perfect example of yeah. how, you know, that opportunity finds you and you have to be open to receive that. I think too often we look at the end result of a person and we go, oh, she had it all figured. Oh, he had it all. Blah, blah, blah. No, that's not really how it is. And for most people I know who are successful, good people, they took some unique twists and turns, not, not out of dumb luck. They, they thought about it. And in many cases, those little twists and turns turned out to be the highlights of their life. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. And my audience, uh, I just want to say, I'm so grateful for the amazing reviews Thank you so much. If you're listening to this and you like it, you know, please leave a five-star review. It, it really helps a lot. And uh, leave your comments, uh, leave your feedback. I'm definitely responding to all those. So I really appreciate it. And Barry, once again, thank you so much for being on. Everything is personal. Thank you, Lynn.